Hello everybody. Today I'm going to be talking about the AWS Certified Database Specialty Exam. This is a pretty interesting exam and it's one that I've mentioned that I had completed in a previous video where I talked about my reflections after 10 AWS certifications. However, I haven't actually made the specific the video you know concerned with the specifics of the exam yet so that's what this is um this is for anybody who's interested in database technology database technology on aws anyone who wants to round out the whole certification set anyone who's a database admin looking to get onto the cloud um those are all sort of situations where you may be interested in looking at this exam and if you are interested in looking at this exam then right now i'm going to lay out my own strategy around how i prepared for the exam how I studied for the exam, which resources I used, tips and tricks, as well as potential pitfalls that you might fall into that um, you know you can avoid by being aware of them. Um, and then also discussing the topics that are covered on the exam. Um, so you know what exactly you need to prepare for. Although of course the, the courses and the documentation and all of that will cover that as well. Um, so let's get started. The first thing I wanted to talk about was the resources that I used to prepare for this exam. And like with most of my videos, if you do just wanna watch the first bit and learn about what the resources I used were, um, and then you go off and use those resources, you'll probably pass the exam. That being said though, you'll gain a lot from hearing about how I own, my own interpretation of the courses um, differed from what you know showed up on the exams um, or particular pitfalls and, and tricks and so on. So let's start with the resources. Um, for this one, it's probably no surprise to anyone who's watched my other videos. Um, my recommendation for the course, the, the best course to follow on this one, and it's also one of the only courses, I don't think ACloud Guru or Linux Academy have actually got a database specialty course yet. Uh, my recommendation is Stefan Marek on Udemy, and this one he's collaborating with Riaz Sayad. Um, this is a pretty long course. Um, no real way to sugarcoat it. It's pretty long and it's also pretty dry. Um, so, in terms of hours, probably around 20 to 25 hours of content. Um, and much of that is uh, to the point where you're gonna need to be pausing, writing down notes, playing again, pausing, writing down notes, playing again. I'll talk about that again in sort of my own, uh, my own strategies when, when I talk about that. Um, but yes, this course is quite long and there's a lot of content to cover. Um, it's no fault of the instructors, but it is a pretty dry course. So you'll most likely end up watching it a couple of times. Um, and then finally, the um, practice exams I used were from Tutorials Dojo. So those have come out pretty recently, um, the database specialty practice exams. Um, and they're very, very accurate representation of what was on the actual exam. I found that the practice scores I was getting were pretty much on par with my final exam score, which was 880 out of 1000. Um, so I could, can't quite say that I got that 900 plus, which is what I t tend to aim for usually. Um, I did sort of feel coming out of the exam that, you know, I had I'd passed and I felt like pretty confident that I had passed by a decent way, like I hadn't got, you know, 760. But um, I did feel that there were a few questions that stumped me, stumped me a bit around a couple of the services. Um, one of those was AWS Backup, which I had never used personally. And then another one was just around all of the migrations and things like that. Had I sat down and done some of these things like the migrations as uh, my own kind of labs and, and practicals that I just designed for myself. Um, I think I would have done a bit better around those areas. Still pretty happy with that 880 out of 1000. It does show that I, that I sort of, you know, I knew the content and, and that the broad um, knowledge of all the database engines and all the services that are assessed was, was all there. There was nothing major missing. Um, but yeah, it was the lowest out of the, um, the, the, the professional specialty exams that I've been doing in the past six months. It's the lowest um, score that I got for those. Um, I just wanted to say as well, around this course, the study strategy that I use, well, normally I tend to watch these courses between 1.5 and two times speed. I have a Chrome extension called Video Speed Controller, which I'll link in the description. I highly recommend this because instead of just using the granularity provided by the video player, you can actually choose the specific speed you want and there's keyboard shortcuts for it. So I'll normally watch mine at about 1.7, 1.8 times speed. Um, and I tend to find that that uh, works well for most instructors. What I did find for this course though, was there was, there was so much content is extremely dense sort of content in, in that 
It, w- it would be like, here's, here's what you have to do for this engine. For example, MySQL uses bin log for repl- replication, and this is where the file gets stored. And then it will say, Postgres does this, and here's where the file gets stored. Um, Oracle does this. And, <laughs> and then you go through all you know, the six database engines, and, and you have to, essentially, you have to memorize these. So in a way, it's a bit different to other AWS exams. I'm never really a big advocate for memorization when it comes to AWS exams, because things like solutions architecture, it's all about the broad concepts and it's all about knowing when you'd use something versus something else. And so for example, if you want to know when you need to use provision IOPS versus general purpose storage, um, there's sort of a cutoff threshold, but you just need to have the general idea in mind. You don't need to remember the specifics necessarily, although maybe in that case, uh, it might be helpful. Um, whereas with the database specialty, you get questions around, uh, you know, where would this be stored? Um, and it's on for a particular engine, it might be stored in one place, and then for another engine, it might be in another place. Or can you do this particular thing with another engine? Um, and there'll be so many different situations where really it's just facts. And, and the only way that you can remember this is either by literally just remembering that a particular thing is possible or not possible, or possible on one thing, but not on another thing, or you would use this service for it. Um, either that, or if you, go and you use these services enough, eventually you'll sort of, it'll become second nature. So I definitely recommend the second case. I probably fell too much into the first um, case for this certification and for this exam. Um, so that's sort of something to be aware of. Um, I Obviously I had had some level of um, experience, plenty of DynamoDB, plenty of um, RDS, and a little bit of Aurora, uh, but various uh, more niche services like uh, Graph Database Neptune, um, I had never used before, so I sort of had to come along and learn these for the first time. I, I tried to apply, uh, I tried to apply the theory that I'd learned, but it's there was so much theory, it's not always possible to do that. Um, so onto the topics covered, which I briefly did mention. Um, number one is RDS, so Relational Database Service. Uh, this is AWS's platform as a service, allowing you to host a variety of different database engines on AWS. Um, and so one of these would be. Uh, MySQL, you've also got MariaDB, you've got PostgreSQL, um, you have Oracle, SQL Server, and there's one, oh, Aurora is the other, which allows you to do MySQL or Postgres and completely dark, different architecture on it, which we'll talk about in a sec. So there's all these different engines that you can use and they all have different capabilities. And then RDS provides sort of a generalization layer over those so that you can control all your database um, systems with the engines are uh, more or less abstracted away. Um, and you never need to sort of log into the instances. Um, and then you get ideas like read replicas and multi-AZ configurations, um, which allows you to be high available, highly available, scalable, and you know scaling your reads and so on. Um, so there's heaps to learn about this, and I could spend literally all day going over it. Uh, so I won't do that, but just keep in mind there's so much subtlety to RDS, and the exam goes into a lot of depth about it. Um, so if you've done Solutions Architect professional or even associate, you probably understand everything that I just said about RDS, but trust me, there's so much more that, and so much more depth as well. So when you talk about replication, every engine uses a different uh, system for replication. When you talk about backups, there's different backup schedules and, and so on. So there's plenty to know there. And then DynamoDB is the next one. Um, so DynamoDB, once again, it's a pretty common service in AWS. Essentially, it's just a glorified key value store. And so what the exam focuses on is beyond just using DynamoDB in normal use cases, we talk about sort of the stretch use cases for it and also about the limitations of the architecture. So you have things like, for example, in DynamoDB, when you want to uh, scale your read or write capacity, um, it can potentially increase the sharding and increase the number of partitions. And then if you need to bring down the read and write capacity, then you may run into problems because the partitions don't merge. Um, so you have, that's the limitation of the architecture, for example. And there's plenty of these. Uh, there's also the idea around um, DynamoDB uh, backups, point in time recovery, uh, global database, which is uh, based off DynamoDB streams. And then there's of course DynamoDB streams itself, um, whether you can integrate this with Kinesis and there's just a whole lot of stuff. I, I know I'm just rattling off uh, potential things that you can do, but you really basically need to know all of these. The next one is Aurora. So Aurora is basically, it's come from AWS having lots of experience running workloads on RDS and gone, what if we actually re-architected parts of the database engines themselves 
to be better suited to the cloud. And so Aurora has this sort of shared storage architecture um, and it allows for really seamless scaling. Um, there's even a serverless version, so Aurora serverless. Um, and then you have different advantages, like for example, the read replicas don't even drain on the capacity of the master. And then you can have uh, cross region read replicas as well. So there's all these different, uh, you can also promote from RDS as well. Um, so there's all these different features of this. And what I'd recommend for, the, for understanding Aurora properly is there's actually a paper that talks about the um, the right model and, and like the quorum and basically the underlying architecture of this and it is a pretty deep scientific paper about you know distributed systems um, but I read this and found it very helpful I believe there is a um, reInvent video which again I will link this in the description that goes over all of the um, more, more or less all of the content in a pretty palatable way um, so that you can get a pretty good understanding of how Aurora works and trust me, Aurora will come up a lot on this exam. So thoroughly recommended uh, that you do that. The next topic is around migration. Uh, so there's a variety of different services for this. So there's DMS, which is Database Migration Services. You've got SCT, Schema Conversion Tool. Um, and you've got AWS Backup, which is for handling backups. And then you have the native backup, backup services, like for example, storing uh, snapshots in S3 when you um, take snapshots of um, RDS instances. So migration and backups are very important and understanding um, how, how they affect the RPO and the RTO versus things like pilot light setups, um, active active and um, a whole variety of these different things. If you've done solutions architect professional, which I probably recommend you do that before you do the database specialty. Um, if you've done that, then a lot of that content, especially around uh, RPO and RTO, you'll have already covered. Um, so that makes it a bit easier to understand. Uh, but you do need to go more in depth in those services, DMS, SCT, uh, even to the point where you've got things like what if we run multiple DMS replication instances? Uh, where should we position the DMS re replication instance? Should it be close to the source? Should it be close to the target? What if the source and target are in a different account or in different regions? Um, trust me, like I said, there's so much depth to this um, certification that you really do need to know all of this. and. Um, like I said, most of it is covered in the course. So the next major topic that comes up is caching. Um, and there's two main services for this. Number one is DAX and number two is Elasticache. So with DAX, it's specifically in front of DynamoDB and um, it serves as a, as a caching layer, but there's limitations to that, um, such as the fact that you're now having to run it on servers. And then you also have um, the problem of you can't use strongly consistent reads. Uh, they'll just skip the DAX cluster. Um, so there's a lot to that. To that as well. Um, and then the, the second one is um, Elasticache, primarily for Redis, but there's also Memcached. Um, and so you need to really have some hands-on experience with Redis, which would be pretty helpful. I've used it before and uh, found the questions didn't really go into too much depth, but it's more it's more around the um, architecture of, of how you implement it into a system. Um, but knowing at least at a high level how it works and, and what it is is very helpful. Um, so with Elasticache for Redis, you need to understand um, how you can persist things to storage, um, how you can handle like scaling of your cluster, um, multi-AZ setups and, and so on. So there's a whole variety of, of different questions around that. Um, and that's most of it. There's actually some more niche database services that are discussed in the exam. Um, but I personally found they came up less than I expected them to. So the course that I was following, the Real CI and um, Stefan Rett course, um, did actually cover in a, quite a lot of depth services like Neptune, QLDB, uh, Timestream, and Keyspaces, DocumentDB. Um, and honestly, each of those came up a maximum of maybe twice. Um, and some of them, for example, QLDB, I don't recall any questions about QLDB in the exam. So it is much less of a big deal than RDS and, and um, DynamoDB and so on. Uh, so not as big of a an issue, but you do need to understand how these services work and especially the services that relate to um, in at least an AWS's view, an inferior way of doing something. So for example, Keyspaces is allowing you to run Cassandra and Cassandra is very similar to Dynamo, DynamoDB. So most likely the questions you'll get on the exam about Keyspaces will be talking about Keyspaces versus DynamoDB. And more often than not, unless there's a very specific reason to use Keyspaces, DynamoDB will be the correct answer. Same thing with DocumentDB, which allows you to run MongoDB on the exam. The more likely they'll talk about, say, migrating that over to DynamoDB or migrating it to something uh, relational so you can run it on RDS. Um, so in other words, AWS is not a big fan of the, they provide these services so that they 
Um, don't lose customers to other offerings like MongoDB Atlas, for example. Um, and for that reason, they don't come up all that often in the exam. And when they do come up, it's more about migration away from them. Um, so you just keep that in mind as well. Anyway, I know I'm talking your ears off, uh, but if this is uh, the exam that you want to pass, get used to having your ears talked off because there's so much detail uh, that goes into all of this. I just want to talk some, about some general tips and pitfalls right now. Uh, so one of them I mentioned before, Aurora, just read the paper, trust me. Same thing with DynamoDB, they have their paper which they're very proud of. It's getting pretty old now, so you know, 15 years ago that they released this. Um, but you should definitely read it as well, get an understanding of why DynamoDB was architected, how it was architected, and sort of what the planned use cases were, and then how it's actually being used and how they've sort of evolved. Um, the next one is around DynamoDB calculations. You need to know how to calculate uh, write capacity units, read capacity units, and so on based off the load and the usage. When you would use like auto scaling versus when you would use provision, uh, when you would use on demand um, versus provisioned, and so on. Um, you should also. With this particular exam, I'm currently studying for the data analytics specialty. I haven't gone for the exam yet, but I was studying for both of them at the same time, uh, database and data analytics, and that was very helpful. So there's a bit of overlap. One of the services I haven't mentioned is Redshift. It doesn't come up as much on database specialty. Um, big on data analytics, but there is some overlap there. And same thing with just Redis, RDS, um, and all the other different database services because they, they relate to storage of data and when you're doing that data analytics, you obviously need to store the data. That being said, there's still, you know, EMR and, and uh, Redshift and, and so on. Don't, and Kinesis and Glue, they don't really come up on database specialty, um, but there is, uh, out of all of the exams, I'd say there's pretty good overlap. One final major tip that I think is really important um, and you will pick this up just following the courses, reading the docs and so on, and also having hands-on experience, which is very, very important. Um, something that you should keep in mind is that because RDS is a platform as a service, you can't actually SSH into the instances. You have no control over the underlying VMs um, that are used to run your database. You can only, you can log into your database, um, but you can't actually log into the underlying instances. And that actually makes a big difference because often there'll be a question that will say, how do we edit some configuration? And in, and one of the options will be you edit the .conf files, which for Postgres, for, Postgres, for example. Um, and you can't do that because you can't actually get into the instance to do that. And that actually allows you to rule out a lot of the options quite often. And I found probably four or five questions in the exam where it really helps to know that. Um, and so the other thing then to keep in mind is, well, if you do want to make configuration changes, how do you do it? There's parameter groups and there's option groups. And parameter groups is generally what you'll be using to make uh, configuration changes. And you cannot edit the default parameter group. You need to create a new one and then apply it to the instance. So that's really all you need to keep in mind there. Um, it can be a big pitfall or it can be a big advantage if you do know that. Um, but yeah, I just want to point that out because it was one of the biggest things that I thought was a really inconsequential point. And I thought it was you know fairly obvious that you can't log into the instances underlying RDS uh, just because you know I've used the service before. Um, but if you didn't know that, I can definitely see how you would have lost a lot of marks there. Um, finally, docs are helpful, read them, uh, don't need to read all of them, it's going to take way too long and most of it is not really that useful, but if you are confused about a particular service or you want to know the particularities of it, just read the docs. And the second one is reInvent Talks on YouTube are really helpful and I'll link a couple in the description that I've particularly found helpful myself. Okay, so that is everything that I want to talk about today. I know that was a lot of content, probably more than any of my other exam recaps. Um, and very dense content as well, similar to the course itself. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you are not up for just information overload, then probably avoid this certification for the moment. And either that or just take it really slowly. You only need to do you know, a lecture a day and you'll be there in a few months. So that's a possibility as well. Um, but you will probably keep in mind as well, if you do this certification over a long period of time, you have the potential to forget some of the specifics and the details over time as well, just because there is so much information uh, to, there is so much information to remember. Um, so the best way to, to sort of cement it in your memory is either some kind of flashcard system. Um, Anki is useful as well as uh, Quizlet are, are possibilities there. Either that or uh, just do as much hands-on as you can. Hands-on is going to be hard to get the coverage, but it is pretty much uh, uncontestable that it's going to be the best way to remember. Um, so with that all said, good luck. If you are going through the certification, um, do let me know. You can just add me on LinkedIn or um, even just comment below and um, let me know how you've gone. Let me know what you found was hard. Let me know what you found was easy and I'll catch everybody in the next video. Thank you for listening.